Hello. So in this lecture, we'll study the behavior of the solutions of the one dimensional heat equation shown here. And the equation can be used to model the diffusion of heat in a material such as a thin metal rod. And the characteristic behavior of the solutions includes that the heat tends to diffuse from the areas of high temperature to the ones of lower temperature and over time the heat will distribute evenly. And in this lecture we consider the heat equation with the homogeneous Dirichlet boundary conditions where the temperature at the endpoints of the metal rod are held at constant temperature zero and we'll see that for this PD it is possible to derive an explicit expression for the solution. In this lecture we'll derive the solution of the heat equation using the so-called separation of variables where we search for the solution txt in a special form that is a product of two functions phi and t0 both depending on one of the two variables of the equation. And if we substitute this equation into the heat equation on the previous slide, then the partial derivatives with respect to t and x translate to the ordinary derivatives of phi and t0. And if we divide the first equation with both phi and t0, we arrive at the equation on the right where we can observe that the left hand side of the equation only depends on the function phi and the function t0 only appears on the right hand side of the equation. And looking at this equation we can also observe that the left hand side of the equation only depends on the variable t and not on x and on the other hand, the right hand side only depends on x and not on t. But we want this equation to hold for all values of t and x. And the only way this can happen is that the, both of the sides of the equation are equal to a common constant that we can call lambda. And comparing both of the sides to lambda, we arrive at two different ordinary differential equations, one for the function phi and one for the function t0. And if we look at the first equation, the equation for phi, we have from the theory of ordinary differential equations that this equation has an explicit solution given by the exponential function. And here in the equation phi0 denotes the value of the function phi at time t equals zero. And now it remains to consider the second equation for t zero. And we can first note that the boundary conditions of the heat equation imply that the values of t zero must be zero when either x is zero or x is equal to L. And now if we first consider the situation where our constant lambda is equal to zero, we can do a simple integration in the equation to note that the t0 function must necessarily have the form ax plus b for some constants a and b. And if we substitute x equals zero into the equation and take into account our boundary condition, we can easily see that necessarily the constant b must be zero. And on the other hand, if we consider the second boundary condition at a x equals l, we'll see that also the constant value a must be zero. And this means that for the constant value lambda equals zero, we can only get the trivial zero solution of the heat equation. And this is not very interesting for us. But on the other hand, if we consider the situation where lambda is not zero, the second order differential equation has an explicit, exp explicit solution given in terms of the exponential function. 
And in this expression, a lambda and b lambda are constants, which may depend on the value of lambda. And they are to be determined from the boundary conditions. And if we start to consider the boundary conditions, we can substitute x equals zero into the formula to note that necessarily the two constants must be related in such a way that b lambda must be minus a lambda. And this way we can further simplify the expression for t zero so that it will only include one of the constants a lambda. Now, if lambda is negative in our expression, it's pretty easy to see that the second boundary condition cannot be satisfied unless our constant a lambda is equal to zero. And this again corresponds to the trivial zero solution of the heat equation and it's therefore not very interesting for us. But if lambda is positive, then the condition at x equals l can be satisfied. But this can only happen for certain values of lambda and this can be seen from the equivalences we have written down here on the slide. And this is because the boundary condition requires that the exponentials on the left are equal and using complex analysis we can see that this happens precisely if lambda is the square of n times pi over l. But if this condition is satisfied, then the function t0 satisfies both of the boundary conditions and it's the solution of the appropriate second order differential equation. And finally, if we take a closer look at the function t0, it simplifies to a sine function times a modified constant a n. If we combine this formula with the solution phi of the first differential equation we had a few slides ago, then we can see that their product, uh, which involves an exponential term and the sine times a constant c n, is the solution of the full heat equation. And at this point it should be noted that the linearity of our equation implies that if we have two solutions of the heat equation, then also their sum and more generally any linear combination is also a solution of the heat equation. And this way all the sums of the functions t n for different values of n are also solutions of the heat equation. And it actually turns out that the general solution of our PDE is given by an infinite sum of the terms of these forms where all of the different values of n are included and c n here are suitable constants. To this point we have not yet used knowledge of the initial condition of our equation and this will be the information that determines the values of the constant cn in the expression. To find the values of cn based on the initial condition, we can simply set t equals zero in the expression of our solution. And what we get is an infinite series that is independent of t. And this is actually the Fourier series representation of the temperature profile at time zero. And because this is a Fourier series, the Fourier theory tells us that if we want the initial heat profile to be equal to our known function t in it, then we should choose the constant cn to be the Fourier coefficients corresponding to this function. And these are simply given by the integral expressions on the last line. And this completes the derivation of the solution of the one-dimensional heat equation. In the second part of the lecture, we'll study the behavior of the solutions of the heat equation by approximating them numerically. And these approximations are completed using the MATLAB function PDPE, and the codes can be found on the course homepage. And if we first want to 
study the effect of the physical parameters contained in the constant alpha, we can simulate the solution for different values of alpha and plot the results. And once we do this, we'll see that the higher values of alpha lead to faster diffusion of heat. And in these pictures shown on this slide, we have plotted the solution for three different values of alpha, ranging from lower to higher when we move from left to right. And when we recall how the parameter alpha depended on the actual physical parameters of the material, we can deduce that higher thermal conductivity leads to faster diffusion and higher specific heat capacity and higher density lead to slow diffusion of heat. In the previous simulations, we let the source term be identically zero. But if we want to study its effect on the solution, we can again solve the equation numerically. And the influence of the source term in general terms is that it can either add or remove heat from the system and the shape and the behavior of the function will determine its exact effect on the evolution of the heat profile. In the pictures we plotted uh, the solution of the heat equation for three different functions q and for a constant alpha and the zero initial condition. In the first picture we have a function q which is independent of time and it's equal to 1 when x is between 0 and 1 half and 0 otherwise. And we can see from the solution that the source term adds heat to the range where x, range of x where the function q is non-zero and this heat then diffuses to the other parts of the system. And in the second example we have a function q which is non-zero when x is between one quarter and three quarters and its values decrease regularly as time t increases. Uh, we can see that in this case the source term adds heat to the middle region of the system but the amount of added heat decreases over time. And finally in the third picture we have a function q that has a part depending on the spatial variable x and a time dependent part that oscillates periodically with the sine function. And in this case the source term adds and removes heat from the system periodically and the change is greatest near the region x is zero where the absolute values of the function are greatest at all times.